guys. All right. So this is D Foster. Many <laughs> of you know him from Easing Anxiety and the Benzo Free Podcast. I know there was many a day that I used to listen to you. Oh, my dog is in the camera. Hey, honey. And Raider's here too. Yeah. <laughs> Raider's here. <laughs> Can you lay down? You're going to jingle the whole interview. Anyway, he'll calm down. <laughs> anyway, I know many of you listen to the Benzo Free Podcast. So do I. It used to calm me down and just give me some validation and support. So I appreciate you for that. Mm-hmm. So let me introduce you to my friend, D. We've known each other pretty six years, maybe. God, probably. I don't know. It's been a while. Yeah. Long time. All right. So D. Foster, D.E. Foster is the founder of the Easy Anxiety host of the Benzo Free Podcast and co-chair and founding member of the Benzodiazepine Action Work Group at the Colorado Consortium for Prescription Drug Abuse Prevention. What a mouthful. I know, it is a long one. (laughs) He is a published author of multiple research papers and global advocate for anxiety and benzodiazepine awareness, education, and support. In 2002, Dee was prescribed clonazepam. Clonopin is the Mm. name by his primary care physician, and he took his medication for 12 years without warning. His withdrawal experience was extreme and became the foundation foundation of his book, Benzo Free, right there, Thanks. right there. <laughs> <laughs> the world of anxiety drugs and anti-anxiety drugs and the reality of withdrawal. G- D is now eight years free and deals with the lingering effects of BIND, benzodiazepine-induced neurological dysfunction. And he spends most of his time working in the benzo community just like me. Yeah. You can find more details about him at easyanxiety.com. All right. Very nice. Thank you. What do you think? I, I that was a read, great intro. I tell you. It's impressive. Yeah. It's almost like I wrote that. Did you? <laughs> and hard one, hard one experience, you know? Yeah. Uh, so let's just, let's start from the story. Like how did you get on a benzo in the first place? And yeah. Like, I what was, led up to it? Yeah. I was prescribed. Um, they can hear us, right? Okay, I want to make sure. I hope yeah, so. Yeah. I'm making sure people hear so. us. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I never know with my audio setup. I'll check. Here. I'll check. You okay. start the story. I'll, I'll check. start talking and okay. you check. Okay. We'll let you know. Um, I actually took my first benzo. I was prescribed back in around 2002 or so I was prescribed clonazepam for stomach distress so it wasn't even for anxiety directly anxiety related issue Mm -hmm. um and I took the drug for 12 years as prescribed um never any warnings of course like the the story that we've all heard so many times not one warning from anybody until finally um I switched physicians a few times and a new physician prescribed Prozac for me um because she thought I needed to come off the the benzodiazepine and I had no idea what she's talking about Mm -hmm. so I of course looked on on the internet Mm -hmm big mistake as we all know um i mean initially Don't google yeah I, I saw the horror stories and i freaked out and had one of the worst panic attacks in my life but um and i went i switched to different doctors and finally went to an old doctor i went to who still didn't believe i needed to come off the drug but was really willing to work with me mm-hmm. and um he made me stabilize for six months which was um smartest thing in hindsight though i hated it mm-hmm. at the time but i was um having a lot of different mental issues of course at the time I was freaking out and everything about what the drug's doing to me I want to get it out of my system you know just poison all, this, yeah, the all poison, the things we you say got it. When we find out yeah. um but he was willing to work with me but he's told me um come back in six months and show me that you're ready to do this and it's funny because I told that to um Anna Lemke when I had her on my show and she was going well that's an interesting approach maybe we might Ooh. maybe she might even start doing that because what I did was I started meditating. I took yoga. I started exercising. I ate better. And I spent six months just, and I came back and said, here's the plan. And I took the Ashton manual as my guide. And I said, here's the plan I'd like to do. I think I'm ready. And he looked at me and said, yeah, you are. And so wow. then we, for over 18 months, I withdrew off of clonazepam. Wow. Um, directly. I didn't, I didn't do a substitution. I just did directly. So I jumped a lot. Unfortunately, after I came off, then it really kicked in as clonazepam often does. You know, it's more usually in the acute phase than it is in the taper. Yeah. Um, but it kicked in and I've had symptomatology since then. Um, but I've been getting progressively better, which is great. Um, and then I had a recent wave, but it's mostly, I think, triggered by long COVID. Mm-hmm. And so long COVID kind of kicked me into a bad wave lately, but I'm actually doing much better now. I had some difficulty swallowing dysphagia, yeah. um, throat tightening. My tinnitus came back in my right ear, pulsatile, and it's very oh, strong. Yeah. But I've seen doctors and I'm getting it checked out. And the good news is they are easing slowly. So I good. think it's just a long COVID trigger. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, and I'm doing pretty good. And I started all this along the way and kind of got things going kind of like you did. It's amazing. So. I mean, yeah. so uh, there's a couple of things I want to yeah. pull on. One, I like the holistic approach Thanks. to a yeah, taper. I don't think and everybody in the audience pretty much knows this. Like you can't just jump off a drug overnight. There's a right. preparation to me there. If you do it the right way, let's say it like that, because none of all of us have that 
a prescriber that's supportive or can no, do it the right so many way. Don't. Yeah, you, so most many people don't. cold turkey. I was cold turkey. I didn't have a choice in the matter, but I like that preparation, like get your diet in tune, get your coping yeah. skills, get your support system, look at all of the aspects before you, you know, embark on this journey. Cause yeah. And actually my good. recent wave in part was because I, I, I um, got away from the self-care. Um, I took important. care of my parents who were in bad shape and took care of them for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And I just wasn't focused on myself. Yeah. Um, and finally, this last six months, I got a new, I just got, went to a new doc two days ago and just fell in love with this guy. Oh, so I got a new doc. Um, I got my colonoscopy endoscopy scheduled. I'm doing more tests. I've done a bunch of tests on my throat, just making sure there's not yeah. nothing else going on. Yeah. You know, as we, as we all know, you eliminate the physical mm -hmm. options. Right. And then you, of course, then you it's walk like, away okay, eventually it, saying it's most likely the drugs. Be, yeah, it's, it's the yeah, medication. It's yeah. a nice nerve system. <laughs> exactly. So, um, so, you know, right now I'm actually feeling very positive um, about what we're doing. We've been having a good time. Oh, we've been having a blast. We went out to a restaurant. We were yeah, we joking with the Thai ladies. We food last night and did takeout. That was yeah. great. We ate gluten. We yes, we did. Probably we had some it. MSG in there. Yeah, probably. You know? Maybe not. Most of them aren't doing that. But some We drank still. coffee this morning. Oh, yeah. I had mine. Coffee. I didn't get mine this morning. We'll too, get it. We'll get, I'll get we'll them get them later. I don't, we were having that conversation. I don't usually drink caffeine when I'm podcasting because it sometimes creates a dry mouth effect. Yeah. And I, so, I need the go juice. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so I'll get mine later. I'll probably get it later, but no, we've been uh, having a ball. It's been ball. a lot of fun. Of course, yeah. Raider's been the dog. Uh, my wife is a huge um, dog person. And so she's taking Raider on two walks already. Oh yeah. He's and she can't, him. she can't stay away from him. So. That's awesome. All right. So let's move to the podcast. So yeah, like, how did you start it? What was the sure. inspiration and um, how has it evolved over the years? Cause I know you, yeah. you've done hundreds of episodes. Uh, 123 now. So yeah, it's been a while. I can't believe it's 123. Mm -hmm. um, when I was recovering, as we all did, I did tons of research. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I had over a thousand articles and studies and everything in this one note file. I had kept everything and I decided I needed to do something with it. So I wrote a book. Mm -hmm. And so I took a few years writing that book and published it and that came out. And right after it came out, I knew I needed to try to promote it. So I created the website, which was originally was benzofree.org. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also started the podcast um, in the spring of 2019 after that. And so it was really just a vehicle to promote my book. Mm -hmm. Who knew that it be would become the primary and the book kind of falls as the secondary. So the, the podcast took off a lot more and I was just amazed with it, um, with people that were listening and people writing to me. And it was that correspondence with the people I worked with, you know, and and, and wrote back and forth to that literally got me through it mm -hmm. because just i know you've done that yeah, too it's like busy. just yeah keep it keeps you, you busy you know you're helping people but they're helping you too yeah it and takes I you get, out of yourself it takes you out of yourself and yeah. just working with their stories and sharing their stories i mean it has been an amazing journey that i would never trade i don't want to go back and not not do the drugs again of course i don't want the, no, i don't no, want no. the clonazepam no. it's not worth that no. but i would never change that change that journey or mm -hmm. um that journey was amazing and i was yeah. really i'm so grateful to people that listen to the podcast and write into me and tell me their stories Right now, I'm trying to keep up. We had this conversation yesterday, just trying to keep up oh, with the emails, the emails and the. Yeah. And I'm trying. I'm so. I'm, if you wrote me, I'm behind. I apologize. I'm gonna get caught. Don't up. Don't write them now. Yeah, yeah. No, no, it's okay. Please still, yeah, yeah. please still send messages in. Just I'm just still yeah. catching up and trying. And I'm trying to get the um, my site um, switched over. So, no longer benzofree.org. Now we're at easinganxiety.com. Um, a lot of the work that I did to help people coming off benzodiazepines, I discovered probably 70% of it was actually anxiety related. Mm -hmm. Because if, you know, as, as you know, if we can help people manage their anxiety and reduce their anxiety, their symptomatology usually eases too. Yes. And that's one of the few things we can actually do, I think, mm -hmm. to help people. There's a lot of other things, but that's one of the keys. Mm -hmm. And so- um, It's almost like you have the symptoms, but then we get anxious about the symptoms on top of then, it. And then it's a spiral. Yep, you got it, yep. Yeah, uh, yeah, the ruminations just kick in and keep going. And so- for me, I realized, so I, I broadened a little bit and some people had listened to my podcast who never took a benzo. They just liked the anxiety wow. stuff I was doing. So I just expanded it. So now we focus on anxiety and the complications of anxiety medication. Awesome. So I try to stick with both of those. Yeah, I really like that. I yeah, like still that. most of our work's on benzos, but we do a lot of just straight up anxiety work too. And I would hope like when you become a full-fledged anxiety coach that it would help prevent benzodiazepine prescriptions. Exactly, yeah. So yeah, I've been kind of, it's like we were telling the conversation I've been an informal coach, you know, for four years because yep, I've yep. been corresponding. Even some people I've talked to on the phone and, and I've been informally coaching. I just haven't done it formally, but I'm looking to set that up now with our new 
um, online community that I'm setting up at Easing Anxiety. So awesome. trying to get awesome. that kind of going and bring in other coaches to work with us too. So, awesome. and we'll That's be, so of course, working in conjunction with, yeah. with Angie yeah. here and other coaches within the community and just working with all them. That's awesome. Yeah. So let's move to research. Okay. Like I love I'm like, if, if I could quit and just do research, that's what I would do. Oh, Cause I just yeah. like working by myself and I really like research methods and statistics. Okay. I was actually kind of a nerd in that area. Yeah. Like I just, I like reading a piece of research and saying how bad it is. Okay. Like I can spot <laughs> it so quick. But you can sometimes. You can uh, sometimes. And there's it's, a lot of bad research. Well, like yeah, I, a I don't lot. Know if you, if you had this, I had the assumption that research was research and it was all good no. before, I, before I went in though. I mean, I didn't understand that there's, there's research, you know, is mm -hmm. comes and goes. And so now I understand after being in that community, now I know there's bad research, there's good research, and yeah. There's uh, ways to rig research to make it look good, there and it it's, and a lot of research is actually marketing. It's not yeah. actually research, but yeah. okay, so research. So how did you come in, become interested in research, and how did you get, yeah. you, I mean, you're on research teams about yeah. Benzo specific. Um, so three or four of them now. Awesome. So, yeah, it's, um, yeah, the first one actually, um, First of all, I mean, as we all know, we started seeing the community and realized the big one of the big things that's missing is research. Yeah. It's really good research on benzodiazepines, on the science behind them, on the experiences behind them. Mm -hmm. um, well, there was a study that um, Christy Huff, MD, and Jay McCubrey, PhD, mm -hmm. worked up, and it was a, a benzodiazepine survey of 2018, 2019. And we had over 1,600 people that filled that out. Mm. 1,207 were qualified. So in the end, we had 1,207 people. Largest internet study ever on benzodiazepines. Wow, amazing. Um, so th those two gals that created that were amazing and did so much great work. Jane brought me in to do some data analysis. My background was database programming. I was a data scientist. So I was never a statistician. I was quite that clear because I still suck at statistics. Yeah. I learned a little bit. Um, but I was a database engineer, so I had all the all the gear and I knew how to work. It, and she wanted somebody to come in and, and do that. Um, and so I started working. I'm petting the dog over oh, no, here, too. He's panting. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was brought initially that, but I also brought with me the real world experience from the podcast of working with all these different people and all the things I've learned, you know, over 750 now I've, I've directly corresponded with and worked with. And so that you start to get that composite yes. picture of what yes. this is like and what people are going through. And so anyway, long story short. Um, that we started doing some work. I did some analysis. Bernie Silvernail of the Alliance for Benzodiazepine Best Practices got involved. He kind of started spearheading a lot of the work that was doing there. We brought in two doctors, Dr. Peter Martin and Dr. Areed um, Finlinson out of um, Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt. And mm -hmm. so Bernie brought them in. Alexis Ritfo, my co-chair at the Benzodiazepine Action Work Group, um, came on and was part of it. And of course, Christy Huff was already one of the originators of it. Mm -hmm. And that kind of created this team. And we also brought in um, amazing writer, Joanne Laquan, who is the consultant writer and she writes most of our stuff. She's just Amazing. incredible. She does this for a living. So wow. she knows this stuff inside and out. Um, so that team kind of became something. And for now, like three years, we've been working together. Mm -hmm. And that was the primary research team. And then once you start working on one, other research teams kind of. So ASAM's reached out to us now. It's and addiction, and substance abuse. Mental. Addiction. Um, oh, God. American Society so for Addiction so medicine. medicine. That's yes, it. Yeah. All right. Okay, I got to do this right. Yeah. Um, break down the uh, so that, there, yeah. there's a study going on right now that um Christy Huff's on too. I'm working with that. JC Curl's working out of, out of Bic. Um, I think Nicole's on. I think a bunch of different people from different groups are on that. Um, there was an Irish study we did. Wait, recently. that's the that's yeah. the working group for SAMHSA for the prescribing and deprescribing guidelines for benzos that's due in 2025. Right, right. Yes, that's the one. Yeah, okay, you're right. It. Got it. Good. Um, there's one that's already published. We did, and there's a second paper coming out on that. We were on with an Irish study. Mm -hmm. um, Katal um, is one of the um, the people at the Alliance, mm -hmm. um, and some other people. And I, I'm not going to pull the name, so I apologize yeah. for that. But there's a, so but, there's a, you get a yeah. picture. There's so there's a all these teams. different studies, and once you become part of that kind of community, you work with some. Then mm -hmm. people are looking for you to come in because you you understand the community and you understand yeah. what people are going through. So that's how all that happened for nice. me. Um, and the research team we work with, with the guys from Vanderbilt and Christy and Alexis and Bernie, um, we, we love working together. And right now we're looking, we just finished our third paper mm -hmm. on the survey. Wait, and, and I want you to take yeah. apart that survey. Okay. What yeah, was I'll be the happy survey? to. Um, yeah. So the survey, um, why don't we take it apart? Just, just explain. like explain to viewers, like what was the survey? What were some of the questions? Yeah. What so we published two papers and we got a third one coming out um, and we'll talk behind it a little bit, but that one focuses on that and also life. Um, experiences, but that survey had, oh, I'm guessing about, I'm going to pull this, 28 questions or so of different aspects. And it looked at some demographic information, 
And it also looked at what the individual experiences were like, mm -hmm. did they take multiple drugs? What drug did they take? Um, what were their symptoms? And we go through a bunch of questions on symptoms and um, also their life effects, which is third paper is covering the life effects. Like does this affect your, your job, your, your job, your family, oh. your social, your driving, all these things. Yeah. Um, and that one's coming out in this next paper. So that was a big aspect of that. We analyzed that um, and, you know, did a lot of reporting on it. And each paper focuses on a different area of that survey. And so we kind of, like I said, the third one's doing life effects. The second one was more on the protracted, you know, region of, you know, what was causing all that and what was causing this lingering effects. And the first one was more on just the initial information we pulled from the survey. Mm. Um, so, and those are all available right now. They've, the first two have been published. The third one will be coming out within the next month. It should nice. be. So yeah. for, for people in the audience, this is not like a cellular um, study that says right. this is what protracted withdrawal is, or exactly. this is what yeah. so is. We'll on, define that yeah. in a second. But. On the limitations, the self it's a self-selected study, um, which of course means that it was a good it was a good analysis of people going through withdrawal, mm -hmm. but there's no control group and there's not it's not randomized. Mm -hmm. So this is actually people that attended, um, people that were participating in support groups, people that were participating with, you know, emails, mm -hmm. people that, so they had to, so, yeah, yeah, so self-selected. So they had to come to us to take the survey pretty much. So what do they, they call this? It. It's not environmental study. It's like, we just call it self-selected, but yeah, it's yeah. just uh, anyway, but anyway, so it's people in our community So of that, yeah. of that body of people who say are, are having long-term effects or having serious effects, because those are the ones most likely looking for support yeah. of those people. Here's what we saw. So that's really what the study does. But there's no control group. We're not comparing it against people who haven't taken benzodiazepines. That hopefully will come with later studies. And but so, this is just looking at what are the commonalities across like what people are the trends? Yeah, who are having difficulty coming off benzodiazepines. That's really who this, pe this group it. is. Yeah. So what did you see in the first two papers? Scary stuff. We saw scary stuff. We saw... Um, um, one of the key things was the duration of some of the symptoms that a lot of people were experiencing over a year. Um, and that was scary at points, but um, we saw a lot of people that were, weren't were warned, mm -hmm. of course, which we kind of saw anecdotally through mm -hmm. the people coming through, coming through the group. Um, we just saw a lot of data showing what symptoms were more prevalent and what weren't mm -hmm. and which ones seemed to be more longer lasting and which mm -hmm. ones seemed to be more, you know, shorter um, and then, of course, we saw the life effects. Um, one of the ones that jumped out, which will be in the third paper, was that 54% um, of the people, I think it's 54%, said they experienced suicidality and or suicidal thoughts. Um, so, um, and don't quote me on that because I don't have the paper in front of me. But um, but it's- Isn't it yeah. right there? No, just kidding. <laughs> Actually, wow, I just lied, right didn't there. I? I do have the paper in front of me. I was peeking. I'm not supposed to read it no, yet. No, you're right. I was peeking. I saw it. Yeah, now I got to actually There's pull it. There's nothing like a good paper to read. I know. I know. You become a research yeah. citizen scientist. I know. I did pull this out because we're doing another thing later on this yeah. stuff. So- Wait, there it is. Yep, this is the, uh, that's the first one. The first table is right here. So um, I'm going to get this right here. Yeah. Um, symptoms, suicidality, that was here. That's, that's situational anxiety. This isn't it yet. Anyway, um, there it is. Suicidal thoughts. So yeah, it's uh, 54.4%. Wow. Okay. Um, average number of, yeah, so 54.4% of the overall um, specific life quantities correlated with symptoms attributed to benzodiazepine use. Mm -hmm. So we, told, we, have some, we asked about a total of 23 symptoms in the survey. And, and then we also asked about a series of about 13 life effects. Interesting. Um, in the survey. Yeah. So, and again, I say we, because actually this was when I said, we didn't design it, Christy and um, Jane designed, they, they get all the credit for creating yeah. the survey. Yeah. Um, we're the ones that were brought on later. I'm brought on mostly to analyze and bring some input from the Benzo community of what I've seen. Yeah. And then of course you have all the doctors who I just, I'm always amazed by these, mm -hmm. but these are doctors who get it. They these get are it. all the ones who have seen their practice, benzodiazepine damage. They're here because they see this as a problem. So these are the ones who really get it. And I'm I'm really proud of our team. Yeah, I Pretty love amazing it. It's team. good. It's yeah. okay. So, well, I want to say one thing about um, okay. research, especially like when it's online and it's on Facebook. Yes. Remember, just so people in the audience, it's people that are actually in a group that are seeking 
you know, reassurance or comments from a group. So it's not necessarily yeah. everyone who's ever taken a event, exactly. everybody who's yeah. ever been through withdrawal. It's people that are in the groups that would, really would answer a survey like that. Yes. You know what I mean? Yeah. For people that came off, which there is a good group of people that come off benzodiazepines with little or no difficulty, they're not in the survey, no. you know, because they haven't been looking for information. Right. So they didn't find the survey exactly. because they weren't looking for support. Yeah. So, and those are limitations. And, and as you brought up, a good thing when you're reading these studies is look for the limitation section. Mm -hmm. And we have that in ours and it's pretty strong. It talks yeah. about here's limitations with this data. It's self-selected. Yeah. It says, you got to read those to understand the data within a survey about, you know, where the, where the possible flaws yes, in what's been flaws. done. So they, limitations are important. They actually taught us in college, do not read the abstract first, read no. the methods first. Exactly. Read yeah. How was this done? How was the study done? And then you read abstract last because right. actually the methods will tell you more than the abstract and you can write an abstract any way you want. Anyway. Oh yeah. Okay. So what is abstract is, is the blurb. The you know, it's exactly. the blurb that goes out there that summarizes things, but it's the marketing statement. It's the marketing. Yeah, yes. exactly. It's not the the, Always... not the guts. It's the marketing statement. Yep, <laughs> yeah. Yep. All right. So tell us and you're like, and I want to get the critical side of this too, but okay, bind, what is bind? Yes, this has been a hot topic. Hot so topic. Yeah, we'll talk about the controversy and political stuff in a little bit, because mm -hmm. that's good to talk yep. about. But let me explain from a standpoint of where this came from and why we talked about it. And I'll try to do it briefly. Bind stands for benzodiazepine induced neurological dysfunction. Okay, and it's a term that actually a team of 12, um, oh, I'm sorry, a, a dozen, a couple dozen, um, I see I'm getting all the numbers handy, um, but physicians, people with lived experience, professionals all got together. This went through several different things, coming up with a term and stuff like that. So that was one piece, and that was all done, um, sponsored by the Alliance and mm -hmm. did that work. Um, and then the other piece was our survey and the research we did. Mm -hmm. And we brought this together in this third paper that, that it will be coming out soon. And um, so BIND was put into there. What we noticed in the survey that brought us to this, and this is what I think is really interesting, was um, we saw a difference between long-term and short-term symptoms coming out of, this was based on the survey. So this is where the survey I think was very useful, that the short-term symptoms, those lasting usually between say, you know, five and 28 days, so within mm -hmm. a month, um, were more the more severe ones, were the seizures, mm -hmm. were the hallucinations, were the um, whole body tremors. Mm -hmm. Those ones showed up as the short-term, yeah. but they didn't usually last beyond 30 days. Mm -hmm. But then we notice a separate group of these protracted symptoms. Mm -hmm. And these are the ones that on average, people said lasted a year or more for some people. Mm -hmm. um, and that was, and they definitely had a longer duration. They were more anxiety. Um, yeah, so yeah, exactly. Muscle pain. And some of the cognitive difficulties, anxiety. Um, and um, um, what was the other ones I was trying to think of? Well, my, my, see, my brain's firing yeah. good today. It's like, yeah. <laughs> coffee. I know, I know. And if I pulled up all the reports here, I'd be able to tell you, but we're more the ones we attribute with a protracted condition of mm -hmm. benzodiazepines. And what we, what we saw was I started seeing that data because I'm the data analyst guy. And I started to point that out in some reports. And as I brought that to the team, then of course the medical brain started kicking in mm -hmm. and they started filling in all the holes that I didn't have. Cause I just saw this, this looked, this looked interesting to me. And what we noticed was so often we attribute, and this is, I think the term withdrawal has been a, a term within the psychiatric drug community that we don't appreciate, you yeah. know, because it's not, is this withdrawal or isn't it? Mm -hmm. We believe we have, we have now some scientific evidence that shows there's a difference here. And that these are two different, you know, subsets. The mm -hmm. withdrawal is the quick stuff that happens that's typical with a lot of other drugs, mm -hmm. you know, especially opioids and other stuff that might have, you know, these hallucinations, these seizures, these kinds of things. But there's this whole other body that probably is more neurological, mm -hmm. okay? And the paper suggested it might be neurotoxicity and or neuroadaptation. Mm -hmm. Again, we don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. We're just suggesting that could be the cause of what these long-term mm -hmm. um, things might be. And so that con that contributing with this Delphi study we did on the terminology came together and that became BIND. And so then the Alliance started to talk about this term because the Delphi study completed and they, they said, this is the term we want to go with. Um, and I was on that team. A lot of other people you've talked to mm -hmm. have been on yep. that team. Yep. Um, a lot, of, a lot of doctors and scientists were on that team too. So that came up. And so in this next paper we're coming out, we will formally introduce through medical literature, through you know medical paper, um, this term bind. Mm -hmm. And um, we're promoting it. Now, I know there's some skepticism about it, and I'm happy to talk about why we came up with the term. But the primary reason was the study evidence started to show that there was a difference between this and withdrawal. Mm -hmm. And we're not saying there's not withdrawal, but a withdrawal is usually acute. It's And withdrawal typically identifies as the medication is still leaving the body. Mm -hmm. That rarely takes longer than 30 days. Right. Okay. 
there's a lasting effect after the medication has left our bodies. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're seeing. And we think this is neuro more neurological. Yeah. Um, and so it was that also the fact that there are a lot of terms for this protracted condition. Mm -hmm. And we knew we needed to try to use one. Now, mm -hmm. somebody, some people use pause, you know, yes. post-acute withdrawal syndrome. Some used benzodiazepine withdrawal syndrome. Mm -hmm. Some used benzo brain injury. Some yes. of, well, there's, we found, we came across over 15 different ones that have been pervasive throughout literature wow. and throughout, you know, the support groups that have been using it. And that creates confusion. Yes. And that actually hurts our cause because they're not tying them together. Well, and those are addiction language words. Exactly. Which is part of the and problem. That's the other thing. We were trying to get away from the term withdrawal because this doesn't, yeah. this does not identify with typical withdrawal from standard medication. Right. This is a different thing. It's more of a neurological. Actually, what it mimics closely, and this is what we talk about in our paper, is alcohol. Interesting. Alcohol, benzodiazepines mimic alcohol more than anything else. There's only two drugs that if you are withdrawn from can actually kill you, mm -hmm. and it's alcohol and benzodiazepines. Yeah. because they both act on the GABA A receptors. Mm -hmm. And so that's why benzodiazepine is one of the most common drugs prescribed for alcohol detox. Yep. Um, because they're they they cross over there and see I'm I'm talking from a non-medical person, yes. I'm a lay person, yes, but um that's one of the reasons. So we we saw that and we decided that hey, let's try to create a term with a good acronym that people can remember mm -hmm. that also is scientifically valid mm -hmm. that might be able to get more attention to the damages that benzodiazepines have created. I like that. So my pushback when yeah, I when, when I originally heard it, I was like, wait, these I get it that it's like we want something more medical, more specific. Because right. when you say withdrawal, like what does that mean? I don't yeah. know what that means. When you say benzodiazepine induced neurological dysfunction, that's very specific. Mm -hmm. What caused it, what it is, it's telling me what it is. Right. But my pushback originally was um but people don't even identify withdrawal. So how are we going to get them to identify bind? Like we're not even, yeah. this is one step removed. You know what I mean? And, that, and it can be, and I get that. And, it, and it's an uphill but, climb. But I feel like yeah. it's a start. Yeah. Like let's call it what it is. And it may, it may not wind up being bind in the end. We're Who hoping, we're hoping bind yeah. will stick. And so far within the community, it's become, I mean, the it's, fact that we get pushback tells me that people are actually listening to That's this. True. That's um, true. And we welcome the pushback. I mean, I'm, the last thing I'm going to be is telling you this is this is absolutely the right term. This is absolutely this. You know, all I can tell you is what I've seen and what this research has shown us and what we're identifying. And we're trying to propose. That's what all this is. It's mm -hmm. a proposal of a term that maybe can be unifying mm -hmm. um, amongst all the different groups and say, hey, here's the identification. This is bind. Because if we can get um, medical establishment to some degree and, of course, the community to buy into one term, we can also then go to insurance. Yes. We can then go and try to get this more recognized and get more coverage for it. And right now with so many different terms, that's so hard to do. Well, and I mean, like in the ICD-10, which is the classification of medical mm -hmm. diagnosis, it's not the DSM-5, right. but the ICD-10 is like the insurance billing codes. Exactly. There is one for benzodiazepines withdrawal, ben exactly, but not yeah. in the DSM-5. No, like, exactly. So and it's also named different things in yes. different places. Yes. And that's why So somebody might be identified with PAWS, say, you know, PAWS. And yet here's benzo withdrawal. Are those the same thing? And then you're getting, and you tell a doctor, a doctor doesn't know the same thing. So you're not getting identified, not you're not right. getting insurance to cover it. Yeah. And this is what we're trying to avoid. We're just trying to create a term and maybe we're not the right ones to do it. We're, we're just suggesting this and we're, we're trying something. Yeah. Okay. But we welcome pushback. We welcome, you know, any kind of disagreement. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're happy to come on other people's podcasts and shows mm -hmm. and talk about it and mm -hmm. tell why we think it, but I'm also, I mean, I, I was on recently, David Powers, you know, had some criticism about Bind. Yeah. Um, he's a, one of the Benzo coaches. And one of my listeners referred that to me mm -hmm. and said, hey, this guy is kind of going after you. And I, I listened and I thought he was respectful. I didn't think he was going after mm -hmm. me, but he had a different opinion. Mm -hmm. And so I was on his show. He was on my show. We talked through it. We came to an understanding. I think everything's good there mm -hmm. now. And that's all I'm looking for is, it's, you know. It's, so it's spurring conversation. Exactly, that's exactly. Good. We're that's talking about point. it. Maybe this is a term going forward. We think it's the right term for it, mm -hmm. but other people might have different opinions and we're happy to hear them. Yeah. You know, I'm, we're not assuming we know everything. It's just, we have this survey. This is one that showed us this differentiation. Mm -hmm. And we thought we'd try to create a term that might identify that and be accurate right. for what actually people are going through that's separate from withdrawal. Got it. So then my second pushback, uh -huh. which I'm sure there's people in the audience watching right now that might have the same one I'm is, sure. but what about Prozac? What about effects? Or Absolutely. And Absolutely. It, especially my experience as a coach. I mean, I say this sometimes, like, I don't even care what drug it is. The symptoms are all very similar to me. I, yeah. I notice clusters of things like benzo people. They have way more fear and terror. They have way more bad mornings. 
Okay. However, like Prozac affects or Cymbalta people, Lexapro people, they definitely have more of the dizziness, the nerve pain, the high anxiety, but they don't explain it as like terror. Each you know, drug so, but it's has so its close. Own. Yes. It's yes. so close. So I know the pushback is okay, you're doing benzo research, but what about the antidepressant research? Yeah. What about antipsychotics? So, and I think that's a great question. And yeah. that's a great question. I'm happy to address that. First of all, we by doing the benzodiazepine research we do and the work that I do, I am solely focused on benzodiazepines. Mm -hmm. That was the drug I took. Now I did take SSRIs, a couple of them, but I didn't take them long-term. And I came off them quickly because I just didn't want another drug messing up my right. withdrawal. Um, but I did take Prozac and I took um, Celeste um, during my, you know, coming off the drug and I decided to stop it. Mm -hmm. um, the last thing we're saying is other psychiatric medications don't have problems. We know they do. Some may be just as severe, some may be worse. We don't know. The mm -hmm. truth is I don't do that research. Right. Okay. I'm focused on benzodiazepines. That's what I do. But do I have a lot of people writing into me saying, by the way, there's problems with antidepressants, with um, psychotropics, with all the other drugs? It's like, absolutely. Yeah. And a lot of these cross over because so many people are taking multiple drugs, yeah. probably drugged. Yeah. Um, and so I do deal with that. And I try to help people out as much as I can. I'm not as educated in those areas. Mm -hmm. And so the last thing I want people to assume is that we're trying to place benzodiazepines up here and all the other ones don't matter. This is just what I focus on. This is what this team focuses on. Yeah. And if you don't think there aren't teams focused on antidepressants, there's a lot there more is. focused on antidepressants yeah. than there are on benzodiazepines. We're actually the small group. Yeah. So I, I, I think by researching benzos makes sense because it's what I know yes. and it's what I do. And I do believe there's differences, not even between the classes of drugs, but within that, mm -hmm. we've noticed differences between clonazepam and alprazolam and lorazepam. There are differences that we're starting to see. In this study, we saw you know, some differences about clonazepam that kind of wake you up. And I took that, so maybe I was more tuned into it, but there's some interesting things about how that is more, it appears to be more um, of a trigger for more protracted cases. Interesting. And alprazolam also has a trigger for more, you know, so each one seems to have their own bad, you know, periods. Yeah, and we're still funny. kind of uncovering that's that. It's funny so. you say that because you can't help it. Like when you're, when I'm coaching people and they tell me they were on Ativan, I start listening a little yes, extra. It was, yep. that, that was the one yeah. I came off last. Yeah, it was like, you know, yeah. uh, Christy Huff, who I work with all the time, um, Dr. Christy Huff, she was on Xanax. So of yeah. course, you know, Aprazolam is what she's tuned into. Right. And I'm of course tuned into clonazepam. Yeah. And so we're tuned in. Um, and so we see, we see more of that. What we've seen on the clonazepam side, and it's totally anecdotal, is that it appears that more of the longer term protracted cases were somehow tied to clonazepam. Interesting. Um, now, it doesn't mean that alprazolam and lorazepam and, you know, Valium, all those other, you know, diazepam, all those ones don't also create that. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's a slight difference. Okay. But we are seeing some, you know, instances and actually benzo buddies, when I was doing my research, they have that on their website and had it on for a long time saying that clonazepam, and this is anecdotal. I don't know yeah, if they have any science knows. behind it. So apologize for repeating it, but that they, there was somebody saying there that clonazepam binded tighter, more tightly to the GABA A receptors. Interesting. Now I did not Who find knows? any yeah. research backing that up. So this is not based on research, but I'm curious as to where Why they, and this that? wasn't on the yeah. forum. This was on their website for benzo buddies. Hmm. Um, and that got me thinking as I started doing research and and I'll tell you that people that come to me with protracted, over half them took clonazepam. Interesting. And yet mm -hmm. Xanax and so and alprazolam and lorazepam are the most widely prescribed. And see, I don't think I see that in my sample. It's interesting. Yeah. Mine is more, if I see a pattern, it's cold turkey, mm -hmm. long-term use. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Or try this, try that, try no, this, try that. No, and those factors are this, more important. I'm saying if you go yeah. to just a just, type of, right. okay. yeah. Um, and also, like I said, I took clonazepam, so I show up in searches for clonazepam more, mm -hmm. and this is my limitation. Yeah. So do more people come bias. to me yeah. because they're clued into clonopin or clonazepam? Yes. So do, is that why I'm seeing more? Might be, and that yes, is valid. True. So I have to admit that yeah. that might be That's why I'm bias. seeing more of those. So I have a bias there and I'll admit it. Interesting. You know. So my not pushback, what's the opposite of pushback? Like my, my agreement with your research, let's say okay. that, is that evidence or the evidence base needs to be established somewhere. Yes. And it needs exactly. to start somewhere. We're doing and research. You're, the you're laying is, the foundation. Yeah, we just need more research, period. We need yeah. more research on benzos. We need more research on SSRIs, SNRIs, on yep. psychotropes. We need more research. That's what we need. And so I, I wouldn't be critical of any research as long as it's done scientifically valid and it's looking for answers. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But I, I totally get the pushback and we're, I don't, I think some people might think we're more arrogant or something and that's not at all no. what we are. We're just, no. we just discovered this and, and, you know, 
two of us on this team are lived experience. I have three of us, you include Jane. Jane's yeah. no longer on the team because she had some other problems. She was still dealing with her recovery. Yeah. Um, so she had to drop off the team. But Christy and I are both still lived experience and we're on the team. So Love we this. get it and we're still working it. Um, but, you know, we're just doing the best we can to try to provide information. And we're looking for new research now. That team, we're now pursuing other avenues, medical records research. We're doing mm -hmm. some surveys through pr practitioners. Nice. So we're looking at other ideas right now on doing research. So And so I saw... Jill and my assistant's in the audience, and she said, people are asking, how do they read this research? Yes, absolutely. Um, the best thing to do with the research is um, the first two papers are both on my site, which is easy to get to at easeanxiety.com. Um, if you go there and, oh, that's a good good question. What's the best way to send Where them to it? Where can they see it? it? Can yeah. we post it below? Yes, we can post it. Can we post it on this? Yep, and we'll, yep. po we'll post a link here. Um, but if you go to my easing anxiety and you just type in... Um, Dang. Was it on the, wait, is it on the Alliance's website? It is, but you might have to search for it. I'm not yeah. sure where they have it posted. I think they do. Actually, if we pulled it up, we might be able to find it. That's a great question. So Thank we'll, you. We'll, I should have been more prepared. After the video is over, we'll put it at the bottom. Yes, we'll put a link so. in here and have access to the first two papers. Yeah. Um, and I should make it more easily find. I, I did. I haven't created a research category on my site, and I've been planning to. Yeah. Where you could just now put you the research. Know. Now they're asking. And so now I'm going to do that. But I have a good search function on there. Okay. And if you just do the search function for you know research or for um, the papers or something, you should be able to find it. So, cool. Yeah. Right. That's good. All right. So let's move on to the roundtable this afternoon. Yeah. What's going? I don't even. Am I allowed to say that? Um, yeah, you, you can. just can't. No, but you, you just can can't. Say that. Okay, so yeah, what are so, we doing this afternoon? Yeah, there's certain things with the third paper because it's not published yet. We can't can't talk about a lot of yeah. details on it. I yeah. can't really spare, fill the num the numbers and when it's coming out, we don't know yet. <laughs> um, but there's a third paper coming out soon. We're hoping, and it includes bind, and it also includes life effects mm -hmm. of these. And those are the things that haven't been published before. So that's yeah. some new information that's coming out. Um, and that one's coming out soon. What was the question again? So what's what are we doing this <laughs> afternoon? Oh, this afternoon. Um, yeah, so I actually asked Angela, said she was going to be here. We're sitting in my, my basement here. I asked her if she could MC a roundtable with all the researchers from that panel. So the research team that worked on the survey papers for the last um, few years are getting together this afternoon. Angela's going to MC it for us, and we're going to do record that. That'll be held until a paper come, the third one comes out. And when that comes out, that'll be part of our press release. That video will be available to anybody who wants to share it. Mm -hmm. So other sites, you know, other groups who have their own YouTube channels on Benzos can share it. And we'll get that up and running. And I'll do a little, you know, tweaking on it and make sure it's ready to go and do a quick intro on it. And that'll be ready to go and people can use that. So it's not just for our YouTube. I will have it on my YouTube channel if people want to link to it. Mm -hmm. But I also make it available for other people to put on their own channels. Awesome. Um, and so people have available. So that'll be part of that promotion of that third paper. It's awesome. Out. I love it. I'm excited just about yeah, so much is something. Happening. It's crazy. It just the, the, like this is a good question. How much has it changed? The world has changed in the benzo world oh in the God. last six years. It's amazing. It is amazing. It's like light speed ahead. And I think it's all due to people like yourself you, who are yeah. out there. Yeah, it's just there are so many good people. I mean, I'm amazed at the people who in the benzo community are working. And the ones I'm privileged to work with who are just tireless. I think I mean, it takes and it tireless. takes all of us doing little pieces. It does. It's, yeah. Like some people doing advocacy in yeah. Colorado or New Jersey or Pennsylvania, and then people yeah. doing blogs and podcasts and coaching. And trust me, there is no want of work no, to be done. There's no want of work. And we were talking just the other day about mm -hmm. um about you know there's there's no all these coaches. Exactly. There's, no, there's competition. no competition. I still no. run into almost no competition. We have multiple coaches out there. Um, multiple podcasts. I just had Nostal Benesty. Yeah, from the I'm going to be on his in July. Yeah, exactly yes. on mine. It's like you know, younger guy, younger because I'm old. Um, younger <laughs> guy who started up his, and I loved him. He's a great yeah, guy, he's and he's great. really got a lot of energy and passion. Has a, a background in social work, and he's another one with lived experience who wants to do who's something tapering. and give back. And he seems very sincere to me, and I, I I love him. I think he's great. So it's that kind of people, you know. Mm -hmm. And I've been on different podcasts, you know. Um, David Powers, Jennifer Swodowski, you got Jennifer Lee, Lee, you got Bayless of Frederick, you got, you got, yeah, Bayless of Frederick and Jennifer Lee have been around forever Ever, yeah. and have always done solid work. I love them, both yeah. of them. Yeah. And they are, they are great. Always good too. But some of the newer ones like David and Jen, you know, Jennifer has her YouTube channel been going for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, all these people are doing great work and I just want to help them yeah. because we need that variety. Yeah. We need different people. And we were talking about that too, mm -hmm. is when you're looking for a coach, I may not be the right coach if I'm going to cut, you know, when I do, oh, that's yeah. my mic. So sorry about sorry. that. I just realized that if I hit the mic um, and you might not be the right no. coach and, you know, and Jennifer Lee has, may not be the right yeah. coach. 
but you can find the coach that fits you yeah. and that's why we need this huge yeah. yeah so no it's all good i think we're all helping each other i just love how everybody's willing to have each other on yeah. their shows yeah. and talk um, and figure things out we're a community that really just has the same goal which yeah. is to help people help. yeah who are I going think, through this and i think it's us on this other side like i think i'm just we're built a certain way. Like yeah. I can't just leave this experience and move on with yeah. my life and act like it didn't happen. No. If you do that, good for you. Oh, yeah. I wish I could do that. I love. I I I recommend that to people. If yeah. you do that, if that's what they want to do, yeah. because just there's go. nothing. You've been through hell. You there's nothing just, wrong yeah. with when you're done going back to your life and living it. That is awesome. Exactly. You know, for me, it's actually selfish. I found a new me doing this. Wow. So I don't want to give this up now. This is wow. the new me. I love what I do. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's not, I, I, it sounds so, what's the, the term funny. I'm going to find? No, I like that because I think that's good. I never thought of it that way because I think the selfish part for me is I like watching people heal. Yeah, me too. And it, it's like, this might sound crazy, whatever. You can fire me if you want to. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I look at it like when someone comes on screen for the first time and I just meet them, Yeah, I can see their suffering. I can also see yeah. their heart and I know they're going to heal. Exactly. Like I don't even have a doubt. Yeah. And like, I, it's not that I, I, it's like, I look through their suffering. I know the health that is in them. That's coming out. That's and gonna you happen. can find that. I piece see that it. Yeah. You can find that area you can work on and you can help them with. And, and I help them like grow that a little exactly. bit. Exactly. And it's not to say the symptoms are not real and brutal and horrific, but they I are. think that's the selfish part for me yeah. is, well, I feel like it's sacred. Like I get yeah. to watch this person exactly. get through the hardest you're, experience you're, of their you're life. You're saving a life to a degree. And I know when they it's, say that, it's, I it sounds, like it's, that, I don't no. either. It sounds grandiose, but I hear people telling me that all the they time. Tell me that too, I know. And I'm like, no, no, no. And it's like, you I did saved, not say, yeah, no. you, saved, said, you your saved your life. Your own I, life. Yeah. I got to witness. I, was, and I hold yeah, your hand while yeah, you were you, saving yeah, your life. You let me be participate with it. I did not save no, your life. Yeah. Cause this is, they're going through hell and the work they do to change things. I mean, I had to go through that. I know how hard that is. Yeah. I'm amazed by it. And, you know, so often they say like your, your podcast, you know, save me. I'm going like, well, you don't understand. Most of my podcast save is me. you. Or well, it saved me, but it's also you. I mean, I yeah. use your stories. Right. I, you right. teach me. It's 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 my audience that is my podcast. Yeah. Without them, I'm nothing. It's like I've learned so much I from them. I do That's the only reason I can speak back on certain topics is mm -hmm. because I've been working with you for a while and I've learned from you. I like um, that. I like this theme of like, what have we learned from working with others? Oh my God. It's 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 a great gift to be able to do this. It really is it because is. it feeds my soul. And yes, we get burnout. And yes, it's hard to listen to stories. And yes, it can be. It weighs on you. Yeah, I and, think... and a lot of people do leave and get burned out. And yeah. I think that, but then there's people like, like Angie who's been around forever doing this and it's still here. And it's still, like, right. and those are the ones that, you know, it's yeah. like, I've been doing it now almost 10 years since I started awesome. helping out on a discussion group. Yeah, You know, and I was looking for help and I started helping others about 10 years ago and I'm still here and it's like, yeah. You know, we're, we're, we're still doing it. I think the things that I like about it is first, I always think I'm, I'm talking to people. That's all I'm doing. I'm just yeah. living, letting them have space to talk about whatever they want to talk about that. I can use my experience and then me, all the research or not research, all the interviews that I've done, all yep. the Medicaid normal stuff I did. I can pull on that to tell them like, this is what we know about research. This is what we know mm -hmm. about healing process. This is what we know about people that get through it. You know, I can tell them things like, no, nobody has ever gone crazy. Yeah. We feel like we are. Nobody has ever died of not sleeping. Right. We feel like we are, you know, but there's so many tender moments that keep me going. Like, and I, I don't never talked about this anywhere, but things like I have like a protracted person I'm thinking of, and that person will know who I'm talking about. And I will be very yeah. careful. But every time they call, okay. we cry together. Yeah. And it's just the people I work with are so heart centered. Mm -hmm. Like I just feel the love every day. I see their heart. I'm going to cry. Yeah. And um, so it's like, that's what keeps me going or like the me love too. within a family yeah. or the person that's so persistent. Like I am not giving up. Yeah, Damn it's, it. It's, my life is worth and, fighting and for. You feel like you can hear their stories or read their stories and you're like going, okay, this one I'm not worried about. Mm -hmm. This one I'm concerned. You know? Yeah, I do. I do. I mean, because I do that a lot. It's like I can tell by how somebody's telling me their story. If, okay, you're going to be okay. This There's one, we got to work with you. you I mean, you know, yeah. want to help because it's just how, to me, it's a lot of times where they're still focused, yeah. where their focus still is. You I, know, think, I think I've seen that less. I don't know. I, I seen. There's definitely like some spiritual struggle. Oh, absolutely. And yeah. I just recently started talking about that with a few people. And I've been surprised how receptive that conversation yeah. is 
Or sometimes I think like, why do I call myself a healing coach? This feels like I'm a suffering coach because everybody's suffering. <laughs> and it's more like, yeah. how do I teach you how to suffer? Because like, that's what's happening. Yeah. And how do we get through the suffering? When you say that, it sounds like you're it's, teaching you how to suffer more. No, that, not that's suffering. What I, know. Like, I know, but that's the terminology is yeah, actually. It's like we talk about, I there's a lot it, of yeah. death talk, a lot of suicide, yeah. a lot oh. of um, struggle and just you have painful, to, scary part, symptoms. part of this journey for some people. And so you have to be willing to talk about the difficult things. Yeah. And you know? like you said earlier, before we keep referencing our earlier conversation, we shouldn't have talked at all. I know. Because the curse because we keep talking about the other day, the yesterday, other day, last yesterday. evening. Yeah. This morning. Anyway, that's what happens. <laughs> you a survivor in person, like you get to be yourself and talk about it and you let it all out and yep. they don't think you're weird. And your wife doesn't think I'm weird, which is awesome. No. She's been around this community for a long yeah, time. I can, she, say, she, I can she, use our language. And she was like, actually my, yeah. my like sixth or seventh episode was my wife. That's awesome. That's caregiver. Because she she wrote my caregiver chapter in my book. Wow. Yeah, it was awesome. And then she also then did a podcast episode on it. Um, Yeah. And then we had one of my episodes was called The Dinner Party. Mm. And I love that one. It was where I met with who's become a good friend of mine. His name's Steve in Iowa. And we were traveling through and we stopped in Iowa to talk to them. And I interviewed them. Mm -hmm. And I decided we were having a conversation on their patio and just chatting about things. And we started talking about benzos and stuff. I said, Guys, I got to record it, and both both and his wife are fine. Wow. And so I set up the mics and everything, sit on the patio, eating pizza, and wow. we started recording the dinner conversation. And what was amazing about it was it became mostly about the women, about about caregivers. the caregiver. Yeah, because we were talking about our stuff, but what we really heard was this dump. You know that we've heard most of it, but not all of it. Yeah. And all of a sudden, the two women started to connect and. Con- share each other Mm -hmm. and it's like and i love that that's why i think those caregiver groups are so important important. for people to be able to talk about hey this is also hard it's so hard you know caring for somebody is a i always say it's a huge ask it's a it's a big thing to care for somebody going through any type of psychiatric drug withdrawal um and so that's one of the things that we have to you know Mm -hmm. have to help out with but yeah i love that kind of stuff i love that kind of connection and that's what i think we give is that connection i love that so yeah my the comment earlier about this was you know, war vets, like we don't want yeah. to talk to anybody who's not been yes. in war because I can yep. explain to you what war is like, but unless you've been in Baghdad right. wearing boots in 130 degree weather with, you know, full battle rattle, you, I can tell you what that means, but you're like, you I don't, don't get it. You don't I don't really know. I don't know it. what 130 yeah. degrees feels like. Yeah. I don't. And I don't know what the weight feels like and holding a weapon and pointing your gun at people. You know, you don't, you, I can explain it to you, but you don't get the full no, experience. I so, agree. so the same thing with Benzo. Yep. Or, or psychiatric drugs in general is just like, we want to know if someone has been through it. You've walked yes. through it. I can see you for me. I, I was always um very worried about showing the RV stuff, like the van life stuff. Okay. And I thought this is too personal, like, you know, you, you, but yeah. my, my clients are always like, no, keep doing it. Cause you're showing me that I can have a life after exactly. this. And I need to see that right now that I'm shooting for something. And then I thought back to when I came off, there was nobody doing that. Right. I didn't know there was somebody up ahead that had healed and like you, you, you were next to me. Like we were yeah, walking next to each other, yep. but nobody was like up ahead saying, yeah, you can live a good life. Yes. You can build a good life. Yes. You can you be one okay. Of the first ones I had on my podcast was, um, and I get it, I think it's Elizabeth McCarthy. I know her Liz. Yeah. She's yeah. a therapist in yep. Wisconsin. She was one of the very first ones. And actually I got to give credit to Bic because Bic put me in connection with I love her, her. Yeah. and she was my first one to pull on and she's a therapist. She cold turkeyed off 20 milligrams of clonazepam. Oh my God, 20? I think, I, don't don't correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's it was lot. it was huge, a ridiculous Holy number. Cow. I couldn't believe it. Because, wow. you know, well, that's 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 20 to one to, val- to yeah. diazepam. So it's wow. like, we're talking. Um, and, and look at her. Maybe. You know, and look at her. And that, that they, yeah. Yeah, and she's, she went through hell, but she's now, you know, she's now working steadily. Yeah. She's doing all this sort of stuff. She's amazing. And that, like you talked about having those people ahead you of you. Have somebody hey, here's somebody ahead. who, you know, yeah. had far more than, you know, I was on two milligrams and that's a lot of clonazepam yes. and, you know, went on for 12 years, you know, it's like, that's amazing. And you see those people that have done that and come, you know, fine. They got through it mm-hmm. and they do okay. So there's some out there, but you those are the that. people I think that do help. Yeah. Um, yeah. Next time you talk to Liz, just, it's like, yeah, yeah she was I my very first she's guest great. on my podcast. I think she's like, maybe 16 years off now or something totally so. normal yeah. back to normal yeah. living her life yeah, yeah. She's, she's she's she was pretty incredible and she was like perfect first guest for me and I, I I'm grateful to her for that she was pretty amazing to have on there love so. that yeah. all right so let's get to the questions okay cool all right we got a couple um what are the do's and don'ts of post taper that's a that's a tough question okay so wait so just so you know he's eight and a half years off I'm seven and a half years yeah. off so you have 
16 years of experience. Yes, that's of right. Getting through this. So <laughs> yes, we do. mentioned coffee. And as I said it, and it left my mouth. I thought to myself, don't brag that you're drinking coffee because yeah. in your in early withdrawal, don't drink coffee, please. Don't. <laughs> it's going to. I, I, yeah. I, I look at this way. I think this is where we might compare because I think we might yeah. have some slightly different philosophies. And yes. I love that. Let's hear it. Yeah. Um, my number one is I avoid absolutes as much mm. as I can. I don't like absolutes. Like right. there's some people say never touch alcohol. Um, there are some who will say, you know, you can't do this or do this or totally avoid this. Yeah. I'm a more flexible in my approach. I try to work with the patient. I like patient led. Yes. I like yes. to say, you know, what, what's going to affect you. I mean, I tried all kinds of stuff coming off. You know, I tried THC. I tried a lot of stuff when I was coming off, didn't get a lot of effect. And eventually the natural approach seemed to be most effective for mm -hmm. me. Um, and I like that. Um, but it's one of those things where I think it's for a, for a, a do for me is, don't get caught up in the dogma of yeah. or religion of I like withdrawal. That. I like that. Because a lot of people are going to tell you, and what I, what I hated was the people attacking other people online for updosing oh, yeah. or reinstating. Yeah, I've seen it's it like, work. You don't know what they went through. No. You don't know what took them. I, I updosed one time. I was in a, it was, you know, coming off my clonazepam and I was out in, um, for work out in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. And I was in a hotel room and I was still tapering. So mm -hmm. it's having a lot of different effects. I was doing that. And a full out panic attack, attack just went nuts. And I had it with me, you know, because I was still taking some and I updosed by, you know, a quarter of a milligram of clonazepam. Mm -hmm. And it got me through that trip. And I stayed up for about another five or six months before I started to taper again. Wow. I'm not saying it was probably maybe the best choice I've had, but it's what I needed to do yeah, to get to that point. Yeah. And all I'm saying is I don't like the absolute rules that people try to place on other people going through this. Yeah. Um, it's like each person's journey is individual. There are some good true. guidelines yeah. we can help provide, yeah. but you know, but you're going to find your way and yeah. we're going to find, we're going to help you find your way. Yeah. I think, I think I agree with you to, to probably 80%, okay. just that it is definitely individual. The only thing I'm really worried about mm -hmm. is like, I see this uh, hypersensitivity stage. Yeah. So some of the more severe cases who are in acute withdrawal, mm -hmm. I've seen when they start trying things. Sometimes it kind of blows up. It can, so it can, I, yes. I will say that I'll give them that warning, but then I'll say, um, but here, everything you try, there's always three possibilities. It'll help you. It'll hurt you or nothing will happen. Yes. If you're willing to take that, because yeah. we don't know, I don't know. I can't tell you what's going to happen if you try magnesium. I don't yeah. know. Some people in the community say it helps me. I could not have gotten through yeah. withdrawal without Epsom salt baths. That is something I, I did. I did Epsom I salt baths too. There yeah. No way. The muscle. Some yeah. people, they <laughs> yeah. say they're worse and they their muscles lock up and then they have to taper yeah, off. A lot of people have bad reactions to magnesium. Yeah. We don't know why. I know. So you have to make a decision based on your, yes. you know, I always say like taper slowly. Don't like jump into yeah. an Epsom salt And that's bath. why I say there's general rules that are helpful. There's some, there's like, some that people. Like alcohol yeah. and acute withdrawal is probably not a good idea no i, I right. think alcohol in general like right now i'm off alcohol i've been off yeah. alcohol for eight months now mm -hmm. you know because i had that wave and i had long covid i still might drink one day mm -hmm. and i still and maybe i can't drink anymore yeah i don't know don't yet know. but i'm going to try now and then but you're right it doesn't mean that trying something may not set you into a big wave and may yeah. not set you back and that's a possibility so you have yeah. to also weigh that consideration so i agree with yeah. you yeah. you got to be careful because for people that are hypersensitive this might set off a huge wave or a downturn. Right. Okay. Well, we got to consider that before you before take you that substance. In. Yeah. Is does the pros, the possible pros outweigh the possible cons? True. And yeah. so you got to think through these things, but you can also overthink them. Yes. yes you know, yes. if or, we, uh, well, we obsess think... about everything we do and eat and drink, um, you know, I mean, you know, you 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 get benzodiazepines and potatoes. Okay. You know, endogenous yeah. benzodiazepines yeah. exist in some That's foods. True. Now it's an extremely now low dose. Now everybody's going to stop eating I know, potatoes. But it's extremely <laughs> low dose. And so you've never noticed it's kind of there. But you're never going to avoid all benzodiazepines absolutely completely. It's not possible. Yeah. Okay. Good they point. exist in nature. Good point. Okay. So we have to figure out, does the anxiety of worrying about it cause more problems than the actual substance that we might be worrying about. And yeah. that's where we got to understand that our anxiety is our biggest enemy most that's of it. the time. You and know? I don't even, I know you're using that term, but even when yeah. I hear that word, I like cringe because I'm like, that's a medical word. And it you is, know? and it is. Yes, you're right. <laughs> but, but like the fear, whatever. The fear, but yes. And, and the fear, I can, yeah, the fear is really the better term because it is the fear that we get caught in. It's that looping thought patterns we get caught in. And that creates, you know, that's creating... An anxiety state inside your body, yeah. okay, which is then often leading to fight or flight. 
your you know GABA receptors have, may have been damaged and they're not receiving the calming message of GABA anymore. And so now you're in this loop of the glutamate kicking in and other drugs kicking in, hyping you up and nothing slowing you down. Exactly. And that loop keeps That's happening. It. And if you keep feeding it the information like anxiety, stress, then you're causing that to keep running. I know. And so, yeah, we got to find ways to okay. calm ourselves and allow ourselves, you know, just a simple breathing exercises can do so much yes. if you have that in your pocket to use when you need it. Yes. So let's talk about fear really quick and then I'll yeah. get the last questions okay. and we're running out of time, but yeah, I can uh, talk because <laughs> I, I, yeah, anyway. Okay. So, um, 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 fear. Okay. So for me, fear showed up as I was afraid of peanuts, mushrooms, yeah. sardines, tuna, garbanzo beans, salmon. Cause I read blogs or I read people had reactions to these things. So I, let's talk about just the fear and withdrawal, oh, yeah. the amount. And this is where I really want to talk is that your brain is very vulnerable to suggestion. You're on a fear loop. Everything you read, you're going to think it's going to happen to you. Yeah. The worst case scenario, your brain is a negative confirmation bias. So I could tell, I could show you a hundred success stories, but you're going to read the one horror story, yes. which I, I was yeah. a horror story. Okay. Oh, yeah. And you're going to read that one and think that's going to happen. But actually the probability is that it's not going to happen, Yeah. you know, or even the horror story healed. So yeah. is it really a horror story? It was just harder for yeah, that I'm person. I'm a horror story. I'm a horror story. And that's you what know? I got some pushback on recently was being a horror story yeah. because I was talking about a setback. Yeah. And maybe that was the wrong terminology and I've corrected how I talk about it now. But either way, the one thing I always try to emphasize is, yes, I still have symptoms and sometimes some severe mm -hmm. at eight and a half years off. I have other things I did yeah. and other things that happened to me. Right. I updosed. I took a fluoroquinolone during my taper. Wow. Prescribed. So um, really transparent. Yeah, which that. which has yeah. neuropathy on its own without yes. benzos. Which so, can cause a benzo-like illness. Exactly. Yeah. So there's a lot of other reasons why I have ADHD. Yeah. Okay. So a lot of things are comorbidities for my, yeah. you know, my benzodiazepine, my bind. Yeah. And so yeah, it's I'm not you. And that's why no. I always try to help you people say, say it's like, yeah. you know, I'm an extreme case. Me I am too. definitely minority. You're the yeah, minority. Me too. Yes. And that's one of the reasons we're still doing this because yeah. we're that minority. We had severe yeah. problems. They've lingered and we're still doing what we do. Yeah. And you we know? live a good life despite the lingering stuff. Amazing. I love my life. I love my life. Yeah. It's better than it's ever been. I know. I have limitations. So what? Yeah. I learned to live with Just them. Just live around And it. they're improving and they've been improving ever since they came off the drug. Yeah. It's a slow process. And I say, uh, <laughs> this, we laughed about this last night, but I said, I have to live in a van just to do this work. Like I, I know. have to try. I love your van. I, I have to have, fun. I have to like turn everything off and sleep in the woods it's just so to do this great. work. Cause it's so hard, but yeah. anyway. Okay. So fear and withdrawal, it's a major, <laughs> yes. major thing that will stay with you for a while. It will taper off. Yeah. And, it will and learning down. tools to manage so your fear. Yes. Can you talk about yeah. that from your perspective? Yeah. In fact, I did a three part series early on, on just managing the fear. It's called manage the fear on my podcast. You can check it out. But I, I, I focus on that in my book. I focus on all the work I do. It's mm -hmm. probably the one thing I focus mostly on yes. is finding tools to manage the fear because that looping thoughts, your the ruminations, they'll oh. they'll wipe you it's out. Killer. And yep. the problem is, of course, is coming off these drugs, that withdrawal, that bind is causing part of that looping yes. because we have the heightened yes. state of anxiety. We have the heightened state and it's a really difficult loop to get out of. Um, and that's one of the things we have to deal with. And there's so many tools you can do. And like I meditation and yoga were huge for me. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I, I got away from the meditation, taking care of my parents and I'm now getting back to it. I'm already noticing the changes already wow. Wow. just being back into about a week and a half. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's already changing me and getting me back to center eating, right. I stopped eating well as I did through my taper and stuff. And so these are simple things you can start to do. And then of course, ma anxiety management techniques, fear, fear man management te techniques. I can't talk. Yeah. Part of the whole, you know, part yeah, of me too, is I can't talk. Yeah, fine. <laughs> At least I'm not shaking. I've done no, that before no, when I've been on a call. No. If I get really anxious about a topic, yeah. I will start to shake. No. Um, but it's just identifying, you know, what's triggering, what's causing, what's causing those. And for me, the number one thing I think for the fear is when you find yourself in those loops, step back, step outside yourself for a minute and notice what just happened. Mm -hmm. What triggered it? Where did your brain go? What were the thoughts that happened? And how did that cycle start? Yeah. Okay. And then you can start to identify pieces. And next time it comes, you can start to do it again. And I am doing that right now. Because mm -hmm. um, I just had a recent one real quick. I have an endoscopy colonoscopy scheduled in two weeks. Scares the out of me. Okay. Because I had a colonoscopy scheduled in my early taper. Mm -hmm. I was so extreme. I had to cancel it. Yeah. Um, 
And I've woken up in the middle of an endoscopy with Ugh. a tube down my throat and I was choking it. Yes, yes. So I have, because I'm, I'm a ginger and I don't do well with yes, anesthesia. anesthesia. Yeah. So I've woken up in, a, in two surgeries oh and an endoscopy. So I have a lot of fear. But I, and so I was, I, I want to have this test. I know I need it. Mm-hmm. And so I changed my thought patterns. And I've been, the last three weeks have been great. Wow. I, I mean, I got it coming up and I'm not, because I changed how I approach it yeah. and how I'm thinking about it. I stepped back, saw the patterns, mm-hmm. and I found a new way to approach it and think about it. Yeah. And I, I put like a that. positive spin on it. I like that. And, so, and behind us, guys, is all his books. And oh, believe man. it or not, I before this podcast, <laughs> I went, th- I love looking at people's bookshelves. Okay. <laughs> you learn a lot. You do. <laughs> you learn a lot about a person. And I was like, oh my God, D, we've read the same books. We have a lot of the same books. And I know. we read them before. Yeah. Benzos happened to us. And I swear, like this book right here, let me get it. Cause why not? We're in real life. Sure. This book right here, like, oh yeah, like changed our... the way. If I would not have read this book, I would not have been made it through withdrawal. Yeah. I'm telling you. That Power of my... Yeah, that one's a great book. book he has about, a lot of great stuff. Just right. about witnessing is what you're talking yeah. about. And mindfulness in general. It's yeah. CBT, just, mindfulness. Yeah. And but witnessing. yeah, CBT, I mean, if, you, if you're not doing some counseling and you feel comfortable with it, that's another great thing for reducing that is CBT. Because yep. it's the most, it actually is the most proven, uh, effective treatment for anxiety is cognitive behavioral therapy. Yeah. And, and I, I actually push the most back. Evidence. I actually okay. push back on CBT. Do you? That, just that. Like when, when someone is burning alive and yes. you tell them to think I about know, it differently, it's no. maybe you're not burning. Maybe you just yeah. need a little water. I feel like that's incredibly. Uh, that's fair. That's fair. Like, I don't know. So CBD, CBT, I do see it work at a certain point, but not like when you're in the big suffering stage. I agree. It's maybe. Once Actually, you I think a lot of these things you, work as you get later. As you get later. Like the beginning you. part to me you. is getting just minute by minute for some people. Yeah. It's like, what can I do? It's, to getting, str- it's getting through the hour. It's getting through the minute. I know. And then I call that the re-entry phase where it's yeah. like, okay, I need to get my life back. I still have symptoms, yeah. but I have to Focus go with them. How do I work with do them? Today. Focus on one yes. little thing you can accomplish. Yeah. That's where I start with a lot of them too. So, And then I would, and I think you would agree with me on this, that once you get to a certain point and you've mm-hmm. done all these coping things, you've had to find what works for you. I'm really big on like once you can, not at the beginning, yes. but once Amen. you can, Amen. once you can, I'm like, I had to go into my symptoms. Yes. This sounds crazy. No. Counterintuitive. But when I would walk in a grocery store and everything was like, all of a sudden I couldn't even stand up straight. Yep. I was like, what is going on? What is happening? I was trying to get curious. Like no, what? I've been, I've been diving what into is my this? depression. I've been yeah. diving into I went my, into Because it. I lost my parents and I've been diving into that. I was running away. And I'm now diving or you're into it. resisting yeah, it. Resisting and I don't it. want to feel this. And, and now, I now if I start it. to feel sad and I start to feel overwhelmed me, I sometimes say, okay, bring it Let's on. Bring it. Bring it. It's amazing because you just kind of pass through it, this you know? It. And it's like that's all what, that resistance was such a. That's what keeps it going, I think. Yeah. And that's what anxiety avoidance. I mean, I don't want to get down too many rabbit holes. But so I'm really big. <laughs> we can talk like, for eight more hours. Yeah. Today. And I can't. I but okay, <laughs> but I'm really big on like in the symptoms, once you can, like if you're if like for me. I was having troubles with grocery stores, driving. Yes. I jumped in a van and took off, scared as t- scared to death. Yeah. And I don't I don't necessarily think that's good for everyone, but I definitely tiptoed in. Like I couldn't walk. There was a period where I could not exercise for years. Yeah. I couldn't ride a bike. I couldn't stand upright. My vision was so all many crazy. things are taken away from you Everything. when you go through these type of situations. And then you have to rebuild it yep. and you have to find a new way to be with what you're experiencing that's not in the mental health system. We we talk I, we talk about the same thing. And then you yeah. rewire and then guess what? That stuff is automatic. Yeah. So right now, for me, exposure therapy that's part of it. It's you know, for me I was talking about the box or the bubble. Mm-hmm. It's like in benzo withdrawal, we have reduced this thing to about here. Because we are so easily triggered yes, by things. Yes. But as we start to heal, you need to, uh, as you can, start to expand that. You want to get back into the world. You want to start to explore. And sometimes those are challenges that aren't comfortable. Yes. But you need to start pushing yourself out. Not when you're extreme. No. But as you start to heal, you can yeah. start growing back out. Yeah. So mine is mine was always like tiptoe into something. Let's try a shopping mall. Yes. But you're going to go in one store and then come out. And I'm going to leave on a success. I'm going to take deep yep. breaths. And yep. the, I like that you mentioned breath because I think we don't feel safe. Right. We are full of fear. Oh, God, yeah. Everything is coming at us. We mm-hmm. have no buffer to stress. And anything I can do to send a signal of safety, which a breath will do sometimes, yeah. holding on to someone. Some, yeah. Sometimes people don't like the safe person like right. that keeps it going. But early stage of getting your life back, you know, there, there, are, there are times tiny you little, need those, you need, like I needed a service dog. There are yeah. times we need that, especially yeah. with chemical 
you know, iatrogenic yeah. injury, like what it's we're not under with. your control. Yeah. But then there are times you need to say, okay, I, I want to move past that crutch. I want to move past that. Yeah. And that's what we try to, you know, so yeah. you come to that stage and I'm in the stage now of expanding my world every yeah. place I can. Yeah. And I'm loving that I'm expanding my world. It's kind of cool. But I couldn't do yeah. that, you no, know, I couldn't do six that. years ago, seven years no. ago. And yeah. even, even me, uh, seven and a half years out, like, it's like, I have to have touchstones. So yeah. like I went to a concert at two years out, it didn't go well. Right. And then I went at four years out and it was okay. And see, then I went yep. at six years out and I had a yep. blast. You know what I mean? It's like, you can see, but anyway, so my point at the, at the end of this is like, because we have to do all these things, because we have to push, mm -hmm. because we've gone through so much suffering, it's pushed us to our very limits, like spiritually, emotionally, physically, everything. That's accurate. There is a new person that blooms out of that. There is. There is. Yeah. And personality change is one of the things we talk as a symptom of benzo withdrawal. Um, and it, it's effective for all the different, um, the drugs. But it's also one of those things that it doesn't have to be a bad thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, most of us, I think, come out with a better understanding of humanity, a better right. understanding yeah. of difficulties. We learned how to deal with suffering better. Yeah. And that's not to say I don't wish it, it would have happened. No, I would never wish the experience on anybody. But if it happens to you, make the most, make the most yeah. of it. And that's my thing is this is still an opportunity. It's a sucky opportunity. It sucks. But it's an Look opportunity for you, perhaps, to learn some new tools and to come out better on the other side. Yeah. And it's just a hard one way to do it. It is. And I wish, I hope we prevent others. Oh, I would, be, I would love that. Nothing I mean, more I think than that's to why, keep this from yeah. happening to anybody. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's answer the last couple questions. Okay, cool. Thank you guys for keeping with us. All right. Oh, there's lots of people saying thank you. Oh, well, so, thank you to everybody. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, people want to know about tolerance withdrawal. Is this still under the umbrella of withdrawal syndrome or does it fit with bind? Does tolerance Good increase question. your chance of bind? Good question. And again, this is something I don't know if we have definitives on. So again, we we're kind yet. of, you know, but both. In fact, it's funny because we created a graph of trying to create the trajectory of benzodiazepine, you know, tolerance, dependence and withdrawal. And I created a form, and then I think Bernie Silvernail created a form, and I think he's mm -hmm. got a good one going now. And we've all been pulling each other trying to create this. Mm -hmm. But it's taken so long because there is not one path. It's just not, so yeah. is tolerance, um, so the question on tolerance is, tolerance is probably withdrawal initially, most likely, but is there elements of bind? Absolutely, there could be. If you consider bind, as we propose it, as being neurological, the neurological effects, neuroadaptation, mm -hmm those will take place while you're still taking the drug, while you're still tapering. So it doesn't mean that bind, it's not so much a timeline, like bind only starts, mm. you know, 30 days after you take your last drug. It can kick in earlier. It's just that bind usually shows that protracted state mm. is what we identify as bind. Does that make yes, sense? Yes, yes. So yeah, it's, absolutely. so, but it's what kicks in is tolerance. It could be a lot of different things. You could have that neurotoxicity or not adaptation already kick in, mm -hmm. and that could be part of your symptom at the time. Yeah. It, but it also could be withdrawn. It's usually called tolerance withdrawal. Yeah. So it, it, it varies, but I know people while they're on the drug on full dose that have symptoms very similar to bind. And I feel so. like we need new language, we do. but we don't yeah. know what is going on. So until we know what's going on, we can't have new language. I know. Well, and also <laughs> there's the axiom that I read all the time, which is everybody is different. Yeah. And that's the problem. That's why it's hard for us, you know, to no. answer these questions because it seems to vary significantly as to, you know, some people don't get tolerance at all. Right. You know, so it yeah. depends. All right. So then uh, please talk about healing the gut. I'm over two years oh, off God, and yeah. mine is super painful. The gut is a tough oh, one. Oh man. I, I just had to come back to it. In fact, that's why I'm doing all these uh, tests. I'm not, I'm I have good. a poop test in my front seat that I'm Do supposed to take. Oh, those are fun. There's a lot of bad as the, yeah, I got the endoscopy is coming up because my acid reflux kicked up again. Oh, no. Um, and so now they're thinking there might be some damage on my throat. Cause I wasn't, I couldn't swallow, you know, for a while I was having trouble swallowing any food. Um, but the stomach is such a huge factor. We know benzo belly, you know, and I'm just talking benzodiazepines. I know it's effective on other drugs. Mm -hmm. I just talk benzos because it's what I yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. But benzo belly, I've seen abdominal distension. I've seen men who look like they're eight months pregnant. Yeah. Okay. You know, and women too, but it's just yeah. odd to see that in a man. Yeah. Um, and so because of the distension is so strong, I've had distension where I was maybe four months pregnant, mm -hmm. you know, the whole gut just takes such a huge effect. The vagus nerve is such a big factor that's related to all this. Mm -hmm. um, we have tons of GABA -A receptors in our digestive system. And there's, so there's such a huge connection. Healing the gut is such a, a such a difficult thing because for each person, it is different. different. Again, yeah. um, I, I went to a minimalist diet when I was coming off, off the drugs. I went to 
for me, it was chicken and white rice. That's a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. it was, it was yeah. very basic. I had to do that for probably five or six months just to get through without having a bad reaction. Mm -hmm. um, I'm now actually not minimalist, but I'm actually reduced now again. Mm -hmm. um, but I think I hate to suggest a certain diet mm -hmm. or a certain yeah. method because, again, it's so individual. And so yeah. I do steer away from doing that. Yeah. But I'm always happy to work with people and say, okay, so what typically has worked with you? What hasn't worked with mm -hmm. you? You know, is, are you more vegetarian focused? Are you more paleo focused? Mm -hmm. You know, what seems to have worked in the past? Let's build off that yeah. and move more that direction because you know your body better than I do. Yes. You know, I like this. And I, I, I'm i the same as you. Like I have a little free ebook that I give people, certain okay, people cool. about nutrition, but it's really just about eating less crap. Yes. It's not about yeah, process, try there's this There's some diet. things that are good to avoid. Processed food. It's not food. food. Don't even call good. it food. Yeah, it's not. It's processed. No. It's and not. I, I'm, I'm guilty. I still eat I know that. me too. We ate yeah. it last but night. When it's you, fine. When, and when you travel, fast food is right there. And sometimes you just need yeah. nutrition. Not yeah. that it's nutrition. But uh, but, it's crap. but we but, all eh. do it. We all do it. But yes, if, okay, so if your diet is 20% fast food, make it 10% fast food. Yeah. You know, take steps where you're starting eating to less eat, crap. Yeah. Eat That's less crap and eat more whole foods, eat more, you know, genuine foods, yeah. you know, I, 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 listen to your body is my number yes. one thing. Yeah. What, what settles, what doesn't settle for you? Yeah. And for you me, know? I'm like this, and this is a bold statement. You ready? If you hire a coach or anyone else, that person should be leading you back to yourself. Yes. I agree with you. We are not experts in gut health. No, this is your chance no. to explore gut health. Yeah. I am not a figure, nutritionist. No, I'm, I'm not a dietitian. But, I'm not a scientist. But yeah. I'm like, this is a, like we said, the way I put it is an atom bomb is dropped on your house and you yeah. have to rebuild your house. Yes. Okay. So this is what benzos do to your life. Yeah. This is what psych drugs do to your life when you go through withdrawal. So now you have to explore gut health and see what's yeah. going to work for you. And for me, that looked like I tried keto. I did vegetarianism. I did ve vegan for a little while. I did paleo. I did ancestral. I did zoned. I, I did gas. I too. I know. I'm trying. A lot. I did and then, map. I've done you know, all these I did all I did Atkins. I did. And, and I have everything. found what works for me and yes. what I feel best on. And I'm not perfect. And I have, that's Thank what God. I, I wouldn't no, want to be around I, if you're no, perfect. I can't, like, I'm not, I'm terrible. I'm not terribly imperfect, they're, they're... but I, I listened to podcasts and, and I read book, you know, yeah. I read audiobooks, all kinds of things. I get my hands on while you're laying in bed, mm -hmm. trying to heal from this. Exactly. That's what we both, but yeah. So it's like, you got to figure out. That's what I've learned yeah. the most. And that's They're, where coaches and people, you know, and having and support groups help because they can help you find those, but it's still, like you said, still it's, still, it's you. still your, yeah. And uh, with the stomach, there's so many variables that come into play. Mm -hmm. And I really don't believe there's one diet for anybody. And that's why it's like, you, we got to help you find the diet that's best for you. So. Yeah. Okay. A caregiver is asking, what is the average time it takes people to heal? Yeah, that's another individual. one that I can't answer. We um, know. <laughs> um, well, it's, it's actually very specific. It's somewhere between a day and about 20 years. Right. Okay. No, it's right in the no, no, I, I, Honestly, I don't know anybody beyond 10 years that still have. I don't problems. either. I really don't. I, don't. Um, I know some people that right at the 10 year mark mm -hmm. miraculously said, I am suddenly fully Hold healed. Right. And I'm going, how did what? that happen at 10? And I'm going, well, I'm at eight and a half. So I'm going, I know I'm close, getting there. It's close. like, but I've, I've, surprisingly, I've heard that from more people. And I've heard people that, you know, two days off that said, no problem. Yeah. It's, it's so very. That's, that's a question we can't answer. So we just can't we don't answer. Know. Yeah. Okay. What about this? Is glutamate toxicity a big part of bind? Does glutamate in foods cause symptoms to spike? Glutamate is a factor for sure. Um, as far as the effect that it has on glutamate production, one of the things with um, the GABA reduction and the um, the um, oh god, see, I'm why my brain's the working. GABA, we're almost done. Yeah. The GABA glutamate yes, balance. The balance exactly. Right? The GABA receptors for. get burned out. Right. The, the down regulation is yeah, the down regulation of the GABA receptors um, actually is in conjunction. If you look at some of Ashton's work and some other work mm -hmm. with um, glutamate, and glutamate is increased. The reception of glutamate is not so much necessarily that it's producing more, but it's received more during that state. Mm -hmm. So when you start to rebalance that also takes time to reset. So not only do you now have the GABA-A receptors less likely to receive the calming message of GABA, yes. but you have glutamate received more, okay? Yeah. And it has more of an effect. And so anything that heightens that glutamate or other neurotransmitters that are causing you to, you know, in, 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 increase during, yeah, excitatory state, um, that's going to have so much more of an effect because again, you don't have your brakes. Like we use the analogy, you know, GABA eight, GABA is the brakes and glutamates the gas pedal. Yeah. We have the gas pedal, but our brake line is not severed, but it's not good. You know, yeah. we, we have trouble calming ourselves. So, um, 
I don't focus solely on glutamate because there's so many there's other so many, factors. It, it touches everything there's else. There's so many, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and the damage is done. It's not just with the GABA receptors, it's mitochondria. It's it's also not just the primary nervous system. It's yeah. secondary. It's like there's so many levels that this has affected. Yeah. And we still don't have a lot of the science of the actual you know, scientific effects. A lot of this is still guessing, even from medical literature yeah. as to what's happening. Yeah. You know, we don't really we don't know. Really we, know. Yeah. We haven't gone in with a little, you know, submarine into the body and seen the cells as they're affected. I just, we just don't him, have that. I just yet. told him last night, I was talking about, this is what the research we need. We need a benzo yes, naive population yep. that has never touched a benzo. I want to look at their mitochondria, their cells, their exactly. GABA. I want to look at all their everything. And then you compare that against a benzo withdrawal protracted with whatever it. that's it that. that's the only study we need why can't we get that done well it's not the only one we need well, a lot of studies one of it's one but of that is yes, a good study for us to do yes start. i would but agree anyway okay so let's get a okay. i think we're almost done with the uh, with yeah, whatever. i just want to ask if they're hanging with it i'm okay so yeah everybody i think we got them all okay if you have any questions last put them through but yeah. this is my question how do i want i always like to end on hope i love it i love it I feel like that should be the name of the my video series. But I think that's a good name. I don't really think I th I've been playing with that for a while. Ending on hope. So what? I like that. I like that. What hope do you have for people in the audience? Because we because well, listen, we've said a lot of scary words. We have. I'm aware of that. Yeah. I know that we're both protracted and we're probably scaring you guys. I work full time. I travel full time. Yeah. I hike. I drink coffee. I'm okay. Yeah. First, yeah. You. First, use us as examples. Yes. We both would say right now, life is good. Life is great. Yeah. Life is yeah. great. So. That tells you something. And we both still have some lingering, little, little things. Lingering. Yeah, lingering things that are still affecting our lives. And yet we're having a great time in life. Yeah. That happens. Um, I would actually say hope is essential. I mean, you have to have it throughout it. Um, the thing is, is that think about right now, like what's different than when we started going through it. Oh, man. The support systems, what the research we've already done, all the stuff we know now that we didn't know before. And that's only going to keep increasing. Mm -hmm. We're learning stuff every week, every month about what this is and what the effects are. Mm -hmm. And um, and I, I think it's just going to be amazing what we can do. And that most people, probably as much as half the people don't even have any complications at all. Yeah. Those that do usually only have them for months, mm -hmm. you know, a few months afterwards. Yeah. Th those who have it for longer than say six months or a year are like 10%, you know? And as you keep going on, that goes down and down. The odds that you are somebody like, you know, like myself at eight and a half years still with some symptoms mm -hmm. are extremely low. rare, extremely yeah. low. Um, and also think about the things I did wrong. You know, I did a lot of things wrong and you can learn from me. You can learn from, from Angela. You can learn from so Don't many people. Turkey. That's yeah, my lesson. but there's so much support. There's so many support groups now. There's so many coaches mm -hmm. starting up things that we didn't even have. Yeah. You know, we just had the Ashton manual. Yeah, that was That's pretty much it. it. It was the Ashton yeah. manual, Benzo Buddies and the Ashton manual. Yeah. That's all that was there. Yeah. And now we have, you know, Geraldine came on with her podcast and we have all these other people that have come there pioneered and Baylissa started doing work and, mm -hmm. you know, Jennifer Lee started doing work and all these people started pioneer all the work. And then, you know, BIC was founded and the Alliance was founded and there's so much more out Way there more, right now. So a lot of the hope there's comes movies, from the support. There's movies, there's as prescribed, yeah. Xanax, take your pills, which I'm not yeah. a fan of, but, yeah. um, and Medicaid normal, yeah. there's yeah podcasts all over the world yeah there's it's it's amazing America. the support yeah. and i know there's still a lot of horrible things a lot of doctors yeah. still prescribing these like crazy not you know telling people to come off them cold turkey mm -hmm. and we're we're trying to fix that and we're we're making some progress mm -hmm. but i would say as far as hope goes is this is a trial by fire mm -hmm. okay it's a trial by fire it is hard i'm not gonna you know for those who get extreme withdrawal severe withdrawal or bind um it's hard it is a very hard thing but those are also opportunities and if you look at it as an opportunity to, you know, look inside yourself, see who you are, what you're made of, talk to people, get support, meet new friends, form new friends. This is a great way to form yeah. people who can, you can go through things. It's like we talk, always go back to the veteran thing. It's yeah. like your buddies from the military, some of those friendships you can't build elsewhere. No. And you go through hardship with somebody, you build. There's so many positives that can come out of this. It's a horrible thing. But it's so many positives. And if you can start to focus on those and see what you can do and get help and help people, you know, come through it, you can get through this. These symptoms, there is nothing we have seen yet that has said this is permanent. Not mm -hmm. one thing. No so scientific evidence, that. nothing. People have healed after 10 years of this, you know, and most heal in a much shorter time. Yeah. So there's nothing we have seen that says it's permanent. It's just 
you got to do the best you can to try to take this opportunity mm -hmm. and, you know, learn some skills, learn some anxiety tools, learn some management things that can help to reduce your sentimentology mm -hmm. and you can get through this. You will. You will so many thousands it. and thousands of people have gotten through this. You will get through it. I yeah. love that. What a great way to end. Yeah. All right. Thanks. So how, I guess, just tell us about your community that you're building, yeah, how so people I'm, can reach you, yeah. how they can buy your book, how they can listen to the podcast. Sure. Everything's on my website, easinganxiety.com. But I also have um, a Twitter and a Facebook now at, at easinganx is my handle. The only exception to that is my Facebook because I had trouble getting that one is e at easinganxfb. Um, but that's my handle out there. But I'm mostly on my website. That's where everything is. Every podcast I've ever done is on my website. It's easily searchable. You can find tons of information. I have full documentations on bind. I have full documentations on withdrawal symptomatology, on different types of benzos. It's all throughout the site. I've done videos on anxiety. There's over 300 posts on there. Um, information you can find and also resources to people like Angela too. all these other resources you can find and find support for. Um, so please, yeah, check us out at easinganxiety.com. And if you want to, you can subscribe there or even join our online community. I'm building that up within the next month or so. I'll be on there more. We'll start to create some support groups. We'll start to have some chats. We're going to do some videos. We're going to do all kinds of great stuff behind the scenes. Um, I just have to have time to do it awesome. yeah, <laughs> as we've been talking hard. about it's a lot of work. Yeah. With all the different groups I'm tied in and sharing and stuff like that. It's just, it's, it's great, but it pulls us away from this work yeah. and it's hard to find that balance. So, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. So thank much. you for also letting me great park in front of your house. Oh, you're welcome. I love having the RV out in front of the house. <laughs> Everybody okay. think it's yours. No, <laughs> I'm okay that's with that. Cool. That's cool. That's cool. <laughs> you're in a good neighborhood. A lot I am. I'm fine. RVs. It's, it's, like, fine. Yeah. It was, it's fine. It's a great, great neighborhood. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for joining me thank today. You. Thank you for this talk. Thank you for everything that you do. Oh, my pleasure. And I know you. even just your voice on a podcast is life saving to some people in my and in my audience. So See, thank you. That's true. Yeah, I didn't have to do that. I was going to make it through this without tearing I up. Can make and you, you just, go. I feel like you're Barbara Walters. You just got me at the end there. And now I'm starting to tear up. So. <laughs> That's so sweet. Oh my God, what a compliment. All right. <laughs> anyway, you. all right. Thank thanks, you. guys. Uh, we'll see you next week. We have a whole bunch of lived experience interviews this whole month. Emma Saunders, Kevin is next week. Kevin is going to talk about tiptoeing back into life, driving again with these symptoms, you know, and then they can't really, uh, sometimes you have to, you, yeah. you don't have a choice. You have to go see yes. your parents or you have to go to the grocery store. What do you do in those situations? And then who's my other one? Oh, I just read him the other day. Who is it? I, said, I don't know. You're Wait, gonna Kevin? Oh, Michelle. Michelle. Yeah. Michelle. No, Michelle Fox. There were two Michelle other ones. Fox. Yeah. She, um, Michelle, Emma, and Kevin. Yes, no, those four. three. It was so four. Four. Okay, total. So thank you for helping yeah. me remember. You're welcome. Anyway, <laughs> and then I do have some support groups forming. We have a protracted group. For people two years off or more, we have zero to two years off withdrawal group and we have a tapering support group. Now we actually have two tapering support groups because it was so popular. I had to split the group into two. So if you're interested in groups, if you're interested in coaching, anything, resources, videos to watch for free, anything you want, it's on my website, angiepeacock.com. That's it. Awesome. Any, any closing words? I just say... She rocks. Oh, she, he rocks. <laughs> he, he rocks. We both rock. There you we've, go. We've, we didn't even say that, but we've made something of our experience. We have. You don't have to do that. It's not mandatory. Nope. We're just, that's how we're built. Yep. And, oh, and of course, Raider's yeah. Gonna say hi. And here's Raider's going to say hi. Hi, there Raider. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. You have a good weekend and we'll see you next week. All right. Okay. Have a good one. Bye. Oh, wait. Let me turn this off. How do I get, wait. I got to find his mouse. Okay. Bye, guys. Bye. <laughs>